if you actually read Charles Dar Darwin's writings, not read about his writings, you'll see he was fascinated with behavior and behavior of animals, of, of plants, of human beings in particular. Um, and thus, if you think psychology is, is defined as the science of behavior, therefore Darwin was a psychologist, an evolutionary psychologist. And so I'm going to um, give a, a few examples of modern evolutionary psychology because that is the segue into uh, this discussion of this major myth that we're going to explode today. Um, First, we have to leap ahead 100 years to Nico Tenbergen, uh, Nobel Prize winner. Tenbergen said, you need to ask four questions in order to understand a problem in biological science. Not just to describe a problem, but to understand it. And neatly, um, it's easy to remember, C, D, E, F. You need to understand a behavior's cause, its development, its evolution, and its function. So when I teach this, I teach, uh, so I can remember all those letters, I start with A, so A, B, C, D, E, F. What is the animal? What's the behavioral phenomenon that you're looking at? A, B, and then what are its cause, development, evolution, and function? And I'm going to make an argument right now to my colleagues who are experimental psychologists that you're not, you're not typically asking all four questions, and therefore you're at the mode of not real explanation, of something I would call para-theory, and not real theory. There is a unifying theory in all biological sciences to include psychology is my claim, and that is the theory of evolution by natural and sexual selection. Let me give some examples first of um, my colleagues' work and then some of mine in the realm of evolutionary psychology. Now, as you are certainly thinking, um, we're saying flat out, as Descent of Man did, that we're probably the most selected upon species on the Earth uh, because there's more um, central nervous system material in us, and we'll do some details on that in a few minutes. I'd also like to um, encourage you to look at the Human Behavior and Evolution Society, which you can find on the internet. It's a rapidly growing field, um, and that's the professional body of evolutionary psychologists, which come from anthropology, from history, from law, from medicine, from every field. In fact, um, evolutionary psychology itself is the confluence of developmental psych, social psych, um, experimental psych, physiological psych, clinical psych, you name it, and um, it, is, it is directly the hub of all of those. Okay, so some examples of evolutionary psychology. First, the works of, uh, of Marge Prophet. Marge Prophet. Um, I can't tell you what she was thinking, but I can pretend that I was there in her mind when she said something like, pregnancy sickness disorder. Okay. We humans, as soon as we become pregnant, we become a medical patient. Now, we've done a lot of research, my colleague and I, who I'll tell you about. Uh, we can't find any other species which has problems with pregnancy and childbirth, routinely anyway. We do, fairly routinely. Um, and so she said, uh, maybe this is not a disorder. If you go back to C, D, E, F, there must be a function. If you, if you consider the prevalence of pregnancy sickness disorder, um, and I've seen everything, everywhere from 33% to 90% of women have some uh, symptoms of pregnancy sickness during, during their pregnancy, but typically in the first trimester. That's real important. Um, uh, Dr. Prophet said, you know, there had to have been a function. She investigated, and to make a long story short, she ended up concluding that ingestion of certain types of berries uh, were very problematic and poisonous to the fetus only in the first trimester. And so for those of you who know what signal noise ratio is and thresholds, we basically, during pregnancy, change thresholds. So anything like that berry or that reminds the body of that berry signals a regurgitation factor. Everything comes out. You're not going to starve to, to death, mom. You'll find food later, but you've got to get that teratogenic substance out of your body. Now, when I said, or that reminds you, as you know well, in sea sickness, as I talked before, there is a dizziness effect, and that's an inner ear vestibular function effect. Um, and so that whole complex is involved in, in um, pregnancy sickness, uh, motion sickness, and the like. The second example is a, a colleague is uh, David Buss, the University of Texas, uh, originally a social psychologist, did a, an amazing first book called Evolution of Desire. He had some just under 40 colleagues, studied 50 cultures on site with surveys, and he discovered amazing similarities in our sexual attractiveness um, universally. Women like men who are a little older, who are taller, who are strong, who are um, hardworking, who can be counted on and so forth. Although 
we've discovered there are two distinct sex drives in females. If you're interested, we can discuss that later. <laughs> um, and in turn, um, men like women who are, are younger have light skin, have other characteristics. And there must be a reason that these attributes are what they are. There must be function. And that leads me to my next collaborator, uh, which is Professor Singh, also at the University of Texas, um, who has discovered that worldwide men like women who, for, during, particularly during the uh, uh, early adult parts of our lives, whose waist to hip ratio is 0.7. And this has been confirmed using live models, using um, uh, paper dolls, using uh, uh, symbols and so forth at 0.7. Now there's variability around that, but 0.7. So interestingly, he says the function is that that's a signal that the woman can provide a viable pregnancy. Okay, and indeed he's found some correlations between measures of uh, safe, uh, medically, uh, clinical, clinical free pregnancy uh, and adherence to the 0.7 ratio. But we're going to visit this again because my colleague Ron Yusinski and I um, have, a, have a different cut, and um, we'll see what you think. Some of uh, the research that, um, that I've done in the realm of, um, of evolutionary psychology includes um, uh, asking everyday questions like, why is yawning contagious? <laughs> well, it is very contagious, and just having mentioned yawning, Somebody in this room, I will guarantee you, is either going to yawn or they're going to try to hold it back. Right? Um, um, so why, why do we, why, why is yawning contagious? You have to first ask the question, why do we yawn? And invariably people say, oh, it's to get more oxygen in or CO2 out. Um, no. An engineering analysis would show that panting is the more suitable device for um, gas transport. <clears throat> Well, it turns out that yawning is all about that you get, as you fatigue, you begin to do this. And so when you yawn, you actually come up, you fill the lungs with air, you're pushing the muscles, you do a lot of pandicular activity like this. You're basically squeezing blood back, back into venous return. That's probably the reason that an individual yawns. Okay, fine. So that individual yawns. Why do I need to yawn? Because she yawned. Um, the speculation is that um, if you go back a few million years or... Um, and we as, a, as a, a band of about 150 people are repairing for the evening. Um, light is going away. We still need to detect predators. And it turns out that the threshold for detecting smell actually is lowered, meaning it's easier to smell something when you have positive pressure on the nasal system. So it's probably uh, speculation. Um, it could be, I should say, that we're simply um, telling each other, you, you need to smell, you smell, you, let's all smell. So because <laughs> Unlike light and sound, um, the, the source of a smell does not necessarily have a tether. So you could actually develop a, a vector, and we're getting more smells over here, these people, and so maybe there's a threat over that way. I, I don't know. Um, the second is um, hemline theory. So I'd heard so many times that there's hemline theory, and to a scientist, I take the word theory very, very seriously. So there's a theory, and I was so fed up with it that I decided to tackle this and chase it chase it and then tackle it. Um, <laughs> the theory is, or the claim is, that when the economy is up, hemlines, hemlines are up. When the economy's down, hemlines are down. So I said, fair enough. I set a null hypothesis that there's no relation between the two. And I sought um, expert um, advice on fashions. And I, had, I had no idea what I was talking about. A-lines and couture wear, and I have no idea. But I had an expert. And so we were able to document the five or ten by ten, ten year changes in hemlines. And guess what? Correlation between the economy and hemlines was, was almost 0.6, positive 0.6. <laughs> so it's really true. Now, I didn't have the resolution to determine which came first, the hemlines and then the economy, or the economy and then the hemlines. But I did, I did offer um, a guess, and that is that it's, it's the economy, which is our ecology. For, for our species, our, our economy is our ecology. That it changes first, and when times are real good, competition at, at two or three standard deviations to the right in terms of attractiveness, attractiveness um, goes way up. Um, so that made sense.